Okay, if we can have your attention, that will be great. Um, I'm Sue Dobson. I'm a professor here at the Business School, and welcome to the Side Business School, uh, and welcome in particular to the Oxford Help End Racism, Everyday Racism panel lecture event. And it's wonderful to see so many people have joined us in person um, and also online. There are many people online that haven't been able to join, but they're interested to hear more about this important uh, project um, of the Oxford and Cambridge experience. So I'm pleased personally to introduce our event tonight, having been involved with the project team. And it's extremely satisfying to see how much has been achieved so far by the dedication and hard work of the team, in particular through the leadership of, of Catherine Pope here, who's Professor of Medical Sociology and Associate Head for People, Equality, Diversity. We're absolutely delighted to welcome our new Vice-Chancellor, um, who's joined us today and will be opening the event in a few moments. We will then be joined by colleagues from the University of Cambridge, uh, Dr. Monica Moreno-Figaro, who is an Associate Professor in Sociology at the University of Cambridge, and will be joining us online, hopefully, yeah? That's working. There we go. That's great. Um, and also Dr. Ella McPherson, uh, Associate Professor in Sociology, uh, who's joined us in person. So Monica and Ella will outline the collective and supportive story-making approach that they have pioneered in their work in the Cambridge and Everyday Racism team, highlighting some of the institutional challenges they've encountered in their work. And then we have uh, Professor Mindy chen Wishart, the Dean of the Law Faculty here in Oxford, who will talk about the launch of the Race Me Too social media campaign, which drew attention to the pervasive racism experienced every day by black and other minority ethnic staff and students in universities. And lastly, we'll hear from um, Cram Brie, Professor of Psychiatry at Oxford, who will respond to these two talks by drawing on his own work to promote leadership and systems change to tackle structural disadvantage. So for our online audience, please feel free to drop questions into the chat for the final Q&A, which will be facilitated by Cathy, and there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers, followed by informal drinks uh, reception at the end, which obviously um, you're welcome to, and we'd love the online people to come, but it's not going to be possible. So there we are. Uh, so let me introduce now our, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Irene Tracy. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, and again, thank you to you and the Side Business School for, for hosting this really, really important event on this uh, really special week as, as we think collectively about how we can, again, tackle racism in everyday situations. Um, as has been uh, mentioned, I am Professor Irene Tracy, and I'm very, very fortunate to be your newly minted Vice Chancellor. And, uh, and it's really great to see many colleagues here. I see some familiar faces in the audience, um, both in person and, of course, to those online as well. A very warm welcome. So tonight's panel event, of course, is about tackling racism, and we know that this takes place every day. We know that it goes unnoticed or can be viewed as insignificant. And we know that people who experience racism may become accustomed to dealing with it and may not discuss or comment on it. And we know that behaviours and talk can be overtly racist or may not necessarily in isolation appear to be so, but cumulatively can be part of everyday racism. So to help end everyday racism at Oxford, this is a project uh, through, uh, that has been funded through the Research Culture Enhancement Fund, and it's been a collaboration, I'm very pleased to say, between the medical and the social sciences divisions. It has sought to learn and to replicate the End Everyday Racism project from the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge, and I'm really thrilled and glad to welcome Dr. Monica moreno Ferrego and Dr. Ellen McPherson here with us tonight. It's not often that we bring the enemy in from the fans to learn from, but, uh, but we must learn and we must share good practice and good knowledge. So the collective story uh, making approach which Cambridge took, um, it absolutely resonated uh, when Professor Mindy chen who's Dean of the Law Faculty, as mentioned here, and a fellow of Merton College, and indeed a dear colleague and friend of mine from my time at Merton, uh, launched the hashtag uh, RaceMeToo social media campaign back in July 2021. So the HERE, the H-E-E-R project, is one of several activities here at the University of Oxford that seeks to tackle racism. I will absolutely be an advocate and a champion of this issue. 
and this is one which I very much hope will be carried forward as the university enters this new era of advancing equality, diversity and inclusion, with, very importantly, a number of key appointments that has been made through our Race Equality Task Force. So, delighted to see in the front row there, taking notes, will be our new Chief Diversity Officer, Professor Tim Soupomasane. And Tim is here with us tonight, so please do take the opportunity uh, afterwards over drinks to meet with him, if you haven't met with him already. We are just thrilled to have lured him from down under to be with us, and he's already hit the ground running and is doing terrific things, and we have terrific ambitions and hopes uh, for what we hope to achieve together with Tim. We've also got new appointments in our Universities Equality and Diversity Unit and a very experienced interim EDU leadership team whilst we seek to appoint a new head of the EDU. And we've also got new chairs of the BME staff network. So it really does feel like it's a new era and a new year and a new beginning. Uh, and of course, with that newness, all this new staff bring new ideas and new challenges. And so using Professor Cam Bu's experience, we hope to make the here a collective approach to end everyday racism. For those who have listened to my um, inaugural address during my admission ceremony, uh, I quoted from one of my sporting heroines, who was a great champion of equality, diversity and inclusion, Billie Jean King. So if you forgive me, I'll say it again. And she famously said that pressure is a privilege. And I said in my speech that Oxford, we should feel that pressure because we are privileged in our resources and in our talent. So let us play our part in shaping Britain, Europe and the world in this era of shifting globalisation. And let us be generous with our incredible resources and the opportunity we provide for transforming life experiences. And let us become the very best we can be. Racism has absolutely no part to play in this future. And I will be there with you step by step to make this one of the most inclusive environments and places to work and to study and to develop your ambitions and your dreams. So thank you very much for asking me to be here tonight and I look forward to the panel discussion. I think I'm a bit frozen. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was my cue to start, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I think we've lost the connection. Okay. Should we... Can you... Will it work if you... Yeah, I can go first. Yeah. Then, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. Nope. There you go. Okay. You. you can see me, I can see you. Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're very happy to be uh, connecting with you with this initiative of the End Everyday Racism, which is a project that Ellen and I started in Cambridge in 2018. And... It emerges from our a combination of things. On one hand, our experience as DOSes and um, director of studies and um, tutors and just lecturers lecturing at the university, getting in touch with an increasing experience of racism in campus between our students and between our um, with with our faculty, with our our colleagues, and we were like, okay. How can we uh, just think about this in an environment that is having a slight or, well, not slight, but, but trying to have a turn to anti-racism, where we are developing new strategies all around, and there's somewhere where the university needs to catch up. And we thought, first of all, we were just joining that environment, that effervescence that was going on. And in that also, we added, of course, our own research interest in social transformation, in social change, and um, our different expertise in my work on racism, Ella's work on, on the digital world and on pluralism and human rights. And we were also very interested in exploring methodologically, and we just put our curiosity, we're also, you know, as researchers, we're very interested in how can we get to know, and here would be like, 
What challenges uh, are present when we want to document conflicting everyday experiences? Is there something we can sort of devise to do this? So that's how we um, put together this idea of developing a platform where people could share their experiences in order to help us map what that everydayness is and how would that work. It's also a context where we've experienced that, and also because I was uh, the race equality champion for the university for f four years, and at that time I was like really noticing that demand that there was for data to prove that racism existed and how it existed and what it, when we were like, well, but it's clear that it exists. How can we make this in a more, um, sort of turn the tables, come from the grassroots and actually give a different kind of data, give the data that we want to give. How would that be? And so those kinds of questions and ideas sort of prompt us to develop and start this work. So this demand for data and to prove racism and, and thinking about the story that we want to give, it also makes us think about, you know, how can we go beyond just retelling the story per se of a racist incident or a racist moment or a racist event. And so we decided to combine here one element that has come out of my own research on racism that is to take into account the emotional effects and the physical effects of racism, the consequences so uh, that it has. So one thing that you will go, you're going to find that makes this project and, and, and particular is the way in which we're very interested in how do people experience, what are the, the sequels, the consequences, the emotional effects, what are these physical constraints, and then how that affects issues of belonging, issues of, well, feeling secure in your environment. How can you think, you know, because our duty in the universe, or our duty, or our, our mission is we want people thinking, you know, creating, if you feel threatened, if you feel you know, devalued if you're constantly under assault, but also if you are witnesses, witnessing mistreatment. So we understand, you know, racism as any, as other forms of oppressions, as organized mistreatment that somehow gets established and legitimized. So everybody is, uh, in a way, exposed to this. So the project as well not only wants to capture how does it feel to be a target of this um oppression or you know racism in this case and you can think about it in other ways but also how is it to witness to see it to see it happening to your colleagues how is it that we get immobilized frozen not engaged and also how is it that we with our silence but also with our actions but also with how the organization is set up um we participate in reproducing. So we aim to capture something that is kind of complicated because also we wanted to look at the everydayness of this. So these are two you know, important aspects of a project, the emotional effects and, and, and the everydayness. So in terms of the emotional effects of, of racism or of oppression, we really wanted to look at what were the emotions that uh, people feel directed to them and also experienced by them whenever they go through a particular issue. What are their physical reactions in terms of from feeling frozen, heartbeat, dizziness, you know, like just feeling very upset? And what does that do and its consequences to continuing in this environment? So these all tell us about the quality of racism in everyday life. And I think those were one, some of the things that we were really interested in, in developing. Um, well, we are interested in, we've been doing it, and uh, we're really happy that this is, um, you know, um, developing here. Um, we also know that these, uh, we are in a growing environment where this kind of work and other, other efforts are uh, seen as, you know, contagious, contentious, that it um, we have to, yeah, navigate it. Uh, under sometimes attacks or other forms of trying to silence this kind of work. I think it's really important to, 
to continue knowing that what we want is just a better, a more, um, not even better, just like a reasonable, productive, rich um, environment where to develop our work. Um, so what, what I think, I mean, I can just, yeah, close just saying that what we want to create is a space of validation and recognition. That was the other, other thing that we realized that when, although there are formal ways to complain and fill reports, we wanted to create a space of validation for people to collect their story, collect their emotional landscape, and sort of gather a communal, uh, even if it's an online, and I think Ella will touch on this, uh, and a communal experience. We want to also generate knowledge about how everyday racism works. And, and now we're very excited to be able to share that knowledge with Oxford and compare it and contrast it and relate it. And when you have your results, or it, and we will continue this dialogue, we can also sort of create, um, you know, a, 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 a wider reading of what's going on in, in the ground. Um, we also uh, want them to move, and I guess I'll, I'll finish with this, from what racism is, which is a, an, an impetus of like th this description of tell us exactly what it is and how it works, to what it does to the community, what it does to the, to the practices, to our everyday um, um, yeah, efforts to create and to be you know, productive of new visions for our societies. So, yeah, I think that might just be for now uh, a way of introducing what the project wants to do from our perspective. We can say more, but I'm sure you're going to be talking about more of the specifics later on of how it's going to run and specifically for Oxford. But just to say that's where it came from and, and, and Ella will complement the next part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And I wanted to say thank you to Kathy and your team because it's been an honor and really interesting and, and a pleasure to collaborate with you all on this. And I want to congratulate you on the launch of HERE today. And also to say that um, uh, we have another sister university, which is Essex. So there's, uh, the End Everyday Racism is now running at three universities, and we hope to have lots of collaborations in the future. Um, so I'm going to pick up from what Monica was saying, um, starting with um, a sociological kind of understanding of what the technology and all the kind of community activity around the technology is. So we see it as a witnessing project. And so, you know, witnessing um, after Peters is seeing something or experiencing something and then saying something or doing something. And witnessing is um, a kind of fraught terrain because it's about stabilizing uncertainty through representation and interpretation of what happened. Um, and when we think about witnessing in our project, there are kind of two dimensions that we were trying to think through, because there's kind of two things that we were thinking about really affect who, who gets to witness and be witness and who gets heard and all of that. Um, and one is on the epistemology side, and the other one's on the ethical side. So um, on the epistemology side, it's sort of this idea of you know who gets to decide who is heard and what is evidence, right? Um, and so here we were working with two sets of concepts. And one is Benjamin's idea of detection, which is being seen, and then recognition, which is being seen how you want to be seen. So this is to what Monica was talking about earlier, where it was we were thinking to ourselves, what data does our community want, and how do they, what do they want to happen with that data? So um, we did a, quite a bit of community consultation about what kind of data we should collect. Um, and then the other is um, Dignazio and Klein's um, kind of um, dichotomy of data visualization. So, you know, charts and graphs and kind of, you know, the cold hard facts and the, you know, um, the sort of line, the line plots versus what they call data visceralization, which is data that you feel, data that moves you, that, that, that gets, gets to you and sort of makes you, makes you yourself want to witness and act and all of that. And so we, have, we were thinking in our project, we have the tension between the first one, which is what often institutions want to see or the, you know, the media wants to see, the kinds of things that kind of circulate on, you know, charts that circulate on social media, versus the second one, which is what we also wanted our project to do, is to have data that people feel, right? And so that is 
um, part of also what we're doing with the kind of embodied and emotional dimensions of the experience of racism. Um, and then the ethical side is like, you know, what, when you think about the ethics of witnessing, it's sort of like, what are you doing the witnessing for, right? Um, obviously, we want to have social change. Um, we want to have, you know, there's different institutional things we might want, but um, also we have to think about witnessing as, so that's witnessing as a means to an end, but witnessing is also an end in itself, in that it is an act of care and solidarity and community building. Um, so we were thinking about all those things when we were designing the project. Um, and we were also thinking about being in this particular information landscape um, that is an information landscape that a lot of uh, movements or projects that are trying to work on social change are facing right now. So one is this kind of technological solutionism, which is what Morozov calls it, but also we can think about it as data solutionism, that like data will get us change or technology is going to solve the problem. And we are a technology project, sort of, right? We have a technology with this anonymous um, testimony platform at the core, but we were also very wary that technology really takes away a lot. And we were really concerned to keep solidarity at the heart of our project, which is why we've developed what we call this methodology of solidarity, where the, um, the platform, the project, is as much about the process of um, kind of working together on this collective case against racism as the product, which is the data. Um, it's about solidarity and space is not just the institutional change and the kind of graphs and things like that at the end. And so um, we think the most important part of our project is the, all of the activity that takes place around this platform. So that's, we do things like uh, pizza lunches where people get together and they sit side by side and they're reporting anonymously, but they're able to chat about their experiences and meet each other. And we've had kind of community events. Um, and also the data that comes out at the end is we think of it as belonging to the community. So we work with different groups in the university who are interested to know more about particular areas, say. Um, there's also um, this idea of the datification of injustice, Benjamin's term referencing back to what Monica was talking about, this demand for lots of data. Um, and so then the data on our terms, looking at these emotional and embodied consequences, is um, was us emphasizing that this wasn't about the facts. I mean, it is, you know, in some respects about the facts, of course, but it's also really we wanted to shift a focus to thinking about the consequences um, and the data that we wanted to provide that our community wanted to provide. Um, a third informational terrain problem that we were facing was this idea of discreditation through pollution. So basically people saying, you know, it's anonymous, what do people game your system and put in fake data? And then, you know, people were trying to help us by bringing this up, but we were saying, we were thinking this, we cannot have a kind of any doubt about this because um, we don't want that sort of idea that it might be, you know, polluted. Uh, with fake data to discredit the whole project. Um, and our approach was very much a trust first approach. So this idea that, you know, we are going to, we trust these reports first and foremost, absolutely, um, because we know that the experience of people who make um, reports and complaints, et cetera, can often be one where they have to triangulate data, they're queried, et cetera, and we wanted to have a trust first feeling in this project. Um, and actually we had this, this technical fix to this, which is, um, that you can only, we don't retain any of the emails, but you can only enter the uh, testimony platform if you have an alumni or a current staff or student email address, so an at cam.act.uk. Um, so, um, so we were facing those, those kinds of challenges. Um, and then we ran the, we did, we've been running the project for a while, and we had our first report of the, our findings, and um, one of the things that we found, which we, we weren't expecting to find in the report itself, but people had added free text kind of at the end. Say, and in this, we were able to pick up this sense that there was this, this solidarity building that was coming through even just participating in the project, you know, even making a report, but especially, I think, as a community, in the community events. Um, and that's from people saying, you know, I feel like my experiences are seen or heard, and, and that makes feel, me feel this sense of community solidarity around this. And so I'll just give a couple of quotes. So one person said, I'm happy that for once someone's addressing this issue in Cambridge, as I felt it was swept under the carpet for too long. Someone else said, it's been great writing this down. It definitely feels therapeutic. Someone said, I, I feel like a weight has been lifted. Um, and someone said, I think this is a great initiative, and Cambridge has no excuse for not having done this before. Um, so. Um, 
This is all to say, you know, our project is ongoing, as, as Monica was saying, um, and we are thinking all the time about what it is we're trying to do with this. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, I think the, the, the point I'd like to close on is the way that we really talk about our project as being about the kind of collective case against racism, looking at the terrain of racism, right, rather than individual cases. Um, and that's for three reasons. One is it directs attention to structural and systemic racism, which is understudied and underaddressed at, at, um, in an educational context uh, of higher education. Um, also, this idea that this helps us mitigate this criticism that, that kind of would stop projects before they start, which is that community members' concerns that they'll be kind of told on, right, through these anonymous platforms with unknown audiences and repercussions. And we've seen that um, in wider media about these kinds of initiatives. And, um, you know, we wanted to say, well, this is, a, this is about the terrain. It's not about the cases, right? Um, and it also, this kind of collective case reminds us that we all have anti-racism responsibility, both individually and as a community. Thank you. And I'm delighted to introduce Mindy chin -Rishart. Um, I said I would get on a stage in Oxford, and I've done my job, so job done. Uh, she's here. Okay. Thank you for coming and in person and logging on to listen to uh, what some will regard as a controversial topic, but maybe not because you're here. <laughs> um, it's a personal subject for me, uh, which has exposed me to criticism and from those people who think that I should remain silent. It started with a coincidence of events within a few days of each other in July 2021. First, I was interviewed by the Pro VC at Oxford about my experience as a racialized minority in the university as part of the Race Equality Task uh, Force consultation in 2021. Now, no one had ever uh, been interested in my views on this subject before, so it got me thinking. Secondly, within a few days, whilst uh, walking with my three adult sons, we were subjected to loud and sustained racist abuse by a man who followed us for several blocks. He had something menacing in his hands and no one intervened, and we were all experienced huge adrenaline shots. There's mother going, keep moving, keep moving, don't react, you know? And then the next day, I came back to Oxford, to go into my office and the facilities management said, who do you have an appointment with? And I had to say, well, I'm the dean of the law faculty. Oh, right, I forgot, they said. He then followed me. And I assume that was to corroborate that I had actually the key to my office. And I pretended not to notice. So I tweeted about these and other incidents and eventually under the uh, race me too hashtag. The aim was never to identify or call out any specific individuals, but to highlight systemic racism and unconscious bias by simply recounting some things, some, some things I can't, some of, only some of the things that have happened to me in my 30 years in Oxford, 280 characters at a time. For example, I mean, apparently I've done 2,000 of these. For example, when I first got my job at Merton, I brought my children to show them around, but an undergraduate tried to throw us out of the fellow's garden. Uh, and then I said, you know, I'm going to show you the dining hall. It's really amazing. But an uh, academic fellow threw us out of there. So I felt quite humiliated, having been feeling very proud and, and so on. So in, in the first tutorial some years ago, when I critiqued the uh, views of a white man, a student said to me, excuse me, I don't mean to be rude, but why are you teaching us? Now, I said, well, I read. You should try. Um, when, when I forgot my library card and asked to look at the reserve books, I said I was a member of the faculty, and the librarian said, but you don't look like faculty. I am walking with my PhD student, who is uh, an Ind Indian, and we were walking out after our supervision, and we stopped in the front quad at Merton to finish our discussion. And a white tourist is taking photos, and she said to us, can you please just move out of my picture, because I want to get a real authentic shot of Oxford. 
I brought a visitor to my class, a judge of the Constitutional Court of his country and former dean of his law school, and the porter looked at the two of us and said, college is closed to visitors, you know, tourists. And I just thought we are suffering reputational damage. As an insecure first female tenure track tutorial fellow attending my first governing body dinner, the colleague next to me said, it must be really hard for you having young children. And I took that to be a very friendly remark until he added, because you can't be a proper academic, can you? And when I answered that, he said, well, and you can't be a proper mother. I thought, okay. <laughs> and then he added that he himself would never immigrate because immigrants never belong. And at that point, I mean, I was feeling quite bullish until then, and I just thought, I want to go home. And people have said to me, oh, come on, Mindy, that happened a long time ago. But the emotional memory remains. The reach and impact of my tweets surprised me. When the hashtag was less than two days old, the Chawel newspaper asked for an interview, followed by other newspapers. I have now even achieved the great distinction of having been on the Daily Mail, um, <laughs> interviewed by Channel News Asia, and so on. And the hashtag prompted racialized minorities to express relief. Uh, they wrote to me in, in huge numbers, relief that their upsetting and humiliating experiences were being aired. A very few shared their own experiences, but most wrote to me privately saying that they had experienced very similar things, but they were too frightened to share their stories. For example, someone told me that a rival for a job in the law faculty said to him, uh, well, I guess they're filling their diversity quota with you. A postdoc whose black husband was challenged going into her college uh, in such a humiliating manner that he would refuse to ever go in again, and so she didn't get to do much of the college activities. The Korean wife of an academic who came to college to meet him and was met by porters who disbelieved her. She never wanted to go to college again, and they left after two years. A black student told me that he was constantly challenged entering his own college, although he was the student welfare advisor there. And he said to me, you know, when I'm walking behind a, a woman at night, I'm aware of the anxiety, and they look back and they see me. And I think to myself, do I walk faster and I pass her? Oh, she might think I'm chasing her. Do I walk slower and give her space? Oh, she might think I'm stalking her. And I thought, wow, you know, racialized minorities are constantly editing themselves for the comfort of the majority. Kai Miller, the professor of creative writing at Royal Holloway, writes as follows in his book, Things I Have Withheld. I'm now a fully fledged professor, and so I was in my office so very early on my first day. It took me by surprise when the door began to jiggle, though it seemed to take the cleaning lady by much greater surprise to see me. She screamed and ran away. I shrugged, and I thought in time we would laugh at this, but soon the campus security arrived, burly men uh, talking briskly into their walkie-talkies, and I had to present IDs and photos to prove that I had a right to be there. I was no longer professor and the woman cleaning lady. I was just a black man and she was a white woman and my presence terrified her. So I do think that we need to enhance training of support services, uh, frontline they are, especially FMs and porters, so that racialized minorities are not constantly made to feel that they don't belong, that they are the objects of suspicion. Not only uh, should they be aware of the problem, but also to manage their biases, to change their behavior, and to track their progress. I am always told in response to this, but they're just doing their job. How dare you, you know? And I ask, but why are they always so good at it, so especially assiduous where racialized minorities are concerned? When you're on the receiving end of it, and it happens all the time, it's exhausting, right? Psychologically, you're constantly reminded that other people don't think you really belong here. Uh, and so when racialized minorities are treated as imposters, it's small wonder why so many of us have such a bad dose of it. Human beings have a fundamental desire to belong. It's third on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs after food and warmth and water and safety. It derives much, uh, it drives much of human behavior, including love, friendship, power, and achievement, these important things. And belonging allows us to feel part of something bigger and more important than ourselves. A sense that we've got roots, that we have a purpose, that we can make a contribution, and that we matter, which is very much core to human happiness. Without belonging, you can feel pretty worthless, shameful, lonely, resentful, 
all negative drivers for poor mental health. Of course, no one ever thinks they're being racist, okay? Kai Muller, again, he says, I did not intend to be racist, they say to me all the time. If there is no intention, how can it be racist? They think the logic is so devastatingly simple and clear that it cannot be answered. But it is only that I have grown weary. As if one could say, it was an accident. I did not intend to push you to the ground. So the pain that you feel shooting up your back cannot be real. It cannot be real because I did not intend it. Now, I also received tweets um, uh, and messages, often from those in the majority group, expressing, expressing shock and outrage. And I was surprised that they were surprised because every racialized minority has hundreds, if not thousands, of these stories. So I felt that the hashtag had an educational function. So my second conclusion is that institutions and individuals need to listen, right? Educational institutions love to display people of color in their websites, glossy brochures to show that their institutions are diverse, and they loudly declare themselves to be anti-racist, but it's sort of color washing, and self-declarations are cheap, right? Kind of insulting if you're not going to listen. It reminds me of Greta Thunberg's description of the endless declarations about climate change. It's all just so much blah, 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 isn't it? Um, those opposed to change often say, hey, Oxford's so great. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But whether something is broke depends on who you're asking. If you'll get a different answer from the slave owner as from the slave, the ax forgets what the tree remembers. But the, that injury is visible. But the injury is usually, in these um, uh, instances, invisible. The analogy is more like the parasitic worm that damages the tree from within, or the headwind that makes everything so much harder, so much more exhausting. So do invite people to share their experiences as students, as academics, as support staff, as researchers, but do it anonymously. And it's really important that the listening doesn't just, isn't just a safety valve, it must not get lost and off into the ether and get lost like Indiana, in, in, um, in Indiana Jones's warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. We just file them all. Um, the stories need to be received in good faith, be disseminated and responded to. But in general, racialized minorities are silent on the topic. And this includes quite senior people who come and come and talk, whisper to me, um, but they won't say anything. It included me before July 2021. Why? I'll give you a few reasons. One reason is that they're met with silencing strategies that really add insult to injury. My colleagues started a list of these and I've added to it. Number one, we, we let you in, we gave you a job, you should be grateful. If you don't like it, go back where you came from. Now, at school's dinner, a student who always thought that I'd failed to appreciate his true genius um, told me in front of everyone at school's dinner to go back where I came from. And when I, I mean, that was quite hurtful. <laughs> and when I returned to New Zealand to visit my parents and my sisters after many years in Oxford, I was told to go back where I came from, which left me momentarily confused. Um, Second, you're successful, and that shows there's no discrimination. And I'm always thinking, yeah, I could have been queen of the fucking universe by now. Um, third, they say that the thing that happened to you frequently, repeatedly, oh, that happened to me once, implication, I'm white, so it can't be racist. Uh, four, simply say that you are being chippy, you're hypersensitive, you're angry, you're prickly, can't you take a joke? Fifth, provide a non-racial explanation for the behavior. Oh, he's like that to everybody. You know, you're not special. Six, uh, individualize the experience and deny the structured or frequent nature of it, i.e. it's about you, really. It's not your race. You know, it's really just that you're not, you know, we don't like you. Um, seventhly, say that their black, Asian, mixed, raced um, friend, partner, kin, colleague, neighbor, children, they don't think it's racist. So, you know, it can't be. Uh, eight, accuse you of being sexist, homophobic, transphobic, intolerant, bigot, bully, harasser. Nine, highlight any mistakes that you might have made, however minor or irrelevant, and make that the issue. Distract, change the conversation. Ten, say, hey, we're the good guys. You're being over the top. If you want us to help, don't make us feel bad. Martin Luther King expressed his frustration 
when he was welcomed by leaders who saw themselves as liberal and anti-racist, but they reacted furiously when attention turned to the need for local change. He wrote, as long as the struggle was down in Alabama and Mississippi, they can say how terrible those people were. And when they discovered that brotherhood had to be a reality in Chicago and the brotherhood extended to next door, then the latent hostilities came out. It was very close to home. I was a bit shocked with this. A friend of mine, a lovely person, said to me, oh, she'd listened to a black woman talk about race and she was so extreme that it made you want to join the KKK. And I said, oh, nothing should make you want to join the KKK. And she doubled down and I was a bit surprised. And I said, oh, 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 I've been learning about this on Twitter. I think it's called white fragility. And she is very annoyed with me. And then she gets extremely upset with me. And I said, oh, oh, I think that's called white woman's tears. Well, she was, she didn't get any better. She was furious. Well, and I said, now, this is super interesting how angry you are about this topic. We didn't speak for a couple of weeks. In the United States, state legislatures have passed laws to prevent material being taught in schools that would instill discomfort, guilt, anguish in any student because of race. Tennessee has now banned the teaching in public schools of ideas about systemic bias and inherent privilege. The idea that you can engage with racism and not be discomforted assumes that racism is out there. What other terrible people do? It's not us. We're the liberal, open-minded, enlightened, we're educated. It ignores the many forms of unconscious bias, microaggressions, the daily chip away at racialized minorities, the burrowing worms, the headwind. It overlooks the polite racism of liberal allies, of the language and the policies that excuse and perpetuate racial injustice. It ignores the unconscious in unconscious bias. Of course, racism doesn't just mean white supremacy. Race and racism behave very differently in different spaces. You know, power and prestige are distributed unevenly based on local ideas about race, color, and phenotypical features. But please listen to racialized minorities with humility, without rationalizing, excusing, avoiding, defending, blaming, or punishing. The proper response should be outrage that we live in a racist society that does not live by its rhetoric of equality in the pursuit of human flourishing, and a sense of obligation to realize that aspiration. A second reason why uh, racialized minorities are silent lies in the idea of stereotype threat. So the idea is that people are likely to perform poorly when they feel threatened or undermined. So a person knows of, um, who knows of negative stereotypes about the intelligence or ability of a group to which they belong will feel threatened and worry that performing poorly will, conform, will confirm that stereotype. This in turn undermines their performance. Now, I'm often told, you Chinese people, you work very hard, don't you? You know, that's code for all kinds of things, right? The main literature here is on African-American students, women, the elderly, students of lower socioeconomic status. Um, a person who rejects the stereotype will still be adversely affected by it. It, I mean, this was a real revelation to me. It produces marked physiological responses. It arouses stress. It lowers performance expectancy. It reduces your self-esteem and self-concept. It induces negative thinking and triggers uh, alienation and dejection. To suppress these feelings of inadequacy, um, self-protective defenses are set, uh, set off, which, but they consume cognitive resources. And it, that interferes with your working memory. It creates cognitive interference and impairs performance. It's like you're multitasking. And that explained to me some of the things that happened to me. Before I came to Oxford, I met an Oxford professor who was clearly very skeptical about this heavily pregnant woman. <laughs> and he put me through very robust Oxford interrogation. I was not used to it at all. And I felt increasingly pathetic and inadequate. And in the end, I know, I'm a contract lawyer. In the end, he said, now, Mindy, why should contracts be enforced? And I thought, I just said, I don't know. I just don't know, you know? I just felt like, I don't know, you know? And when I got the postdoc research fellowship in Oxford, many of my New Zealand colleagues were entirely mystified. And they kept saying, why did they pick you? Why did they pick you? And I kept coming up with rather inadequate answers. And in the end, I just said, because I was hot, you know? <laughs> um, 
I told a white colleague that I always have to be very well prepared for conference talks because I start with a credibility gap. I have to prove why I'm even up there. Why am I speaking? And he said, oh, wow, it never occurs to me that I won't be good enough. And I thought, wow, what's, what is it like to be a mediocre man? Um, <laughs> so experiments can induce stereotype threat by reminding people of negative stereotypes about their social identity. So an example is a group of mixed high and low caste boys in India were asked to solve mazes. When they didn't know which caste each other belonged to, their results were remarkably similar. But when the caste identity was revealed, the higher caste boys outperformed the lower caste boys by 23%. Similar experiments uh, were conducted elsewhere. The only difference is that they know that other people know of their group membership. Now, racialized minorities are always highly visible, right? I can't hide this. If I forget, I'm reminded. So during our undergraduate admissions interview, a 17-year-old candidate said to me, wow, your mum and dad must be really proud of you. And I thought, do my middle-aged white colleagues get that? I don't think so. Unconscious bias is our instinctive automatic response to others based on deeply ingrained beliefs, family values, cultures. They're absorbed by children even before school age. And I remember my son, my eldest son when he was five, uh, you know, I, I told him he had to go to the toilet before we went out. And he said, I don't need to go. To, and I said, you do have to go. He went, oh, I did have to go. And I said, see, mums know about these things. And he said, but mums don't know as much as dads. And I thought, Right. Why is that? You know, and he said, oh, because dads go to work and mums stay at home. And I said, so where does, what does dad do during the week? Oh, he stays at home with us. And I said, what do you, what do you, what do, where do I go? Oh, we take you to work. So, you know, everything he was absorbing trumped his own lived experience. Um, you know, I you know, remember watching Ninja Turtles with him, and obviously the woman gets into trouble, and I'm going, oh no, April's in trouble. He goes, don't worry, Mum, a man will come and save her. And damn it, but a man came and saved her. You know? So, so these things are internalized by us, but also about race. Even women and racial minorities exhibit bias against women and racialized minorities. Best example is from Nelson Mandela. I've been reading his Long Walk to Freedom, and he tells of boarding an Ethiopian Airways flight in his early days. He said that when he saw the pilot was black, he had to suppress a panic that arose within him because he thought, how could a black man fly an airplane? And I thought, if it's good enough for him, we should be humble enough to admit it ourselves. Now, perhaps, and I, I had this epiphany, and I thought, perhaps if I met a Taiwanese woman educated in New Zealand who purports to be a professor and dean of the Oxford Law Faculty, I would be very dubious about her. So we need allies to drive systemic improvements to workplace policies, to fight injustice, and to pr promote e equity through validating racialized minorities. I see you. I hear you, I respect you, I acknowledge the pain that you have suffered through supportive personal relationships. Now, I receive these amazing emails, you know, I hope to honor your generosity in sharing your experiences by working harder to never marginalize my colleagues and to always intervene when I see, hear, or read racism in professional contexts. Someone else wrote, I'm listening and reflecting, learning and wanting to be part of the change. Academics and other UK facility, uh, faculties and beyond emailed to say that they would open or they would further their discussions on racism by a reference to the hashtag. Uh, in Germany, one said, the conversation has just started. We really need this debate. Now, allies take responsibility for the imperfect world that they've inherited in the same way that we all have to take responsibility for the environment. They pay attention to how women, racialized, and other minorities experience meetings, other gatherings, teaching, and they stay alert to inequities and disparities. Were they ignored? Were they talked over? A student said to me, look, often my professors, who are mostly male, will engage in banter with male students, but they maintain their distance with me and other female minority students. That makes me feel bad, and I won't speak unless I'm sure that I'm right because I'm worried about being humiliated. Allies engage in acts of public support. They respect, they draw attention to, they support what the racialized person has said. They don't just sneak up, and I've had a lot of this. People come up to you, you go, Mindy, you go, and I'm right behind you, you know? And they tell you that to you in private. They will never support you in public. 
Allies do their homework. They read, they listen, they watch, they deepen their understanding. And I'm often told when I tweet about things that have, Mindy, I hope you called it out. You must have called it out. Report this person. And I think, I think um, no, it's not my job to educate you. I don't have the time or the emotional energy to do all of that. And I'm often asked, well, what do you want us to do? And I think, well, it's not my job to formulate policies for institutions. I don't have a special responsibility for this. I'm doing all of this stuff extracurricularly. And I think, oh, actually, you're paid to do this. Come up with some plans. Allies consider how their own behaviors might have perpetuated discrimination. They own their privilege. They recognize the extra obstacles, the headwind that racialized minorities contend with that they don't as a white person. This can be painful because it undermines the myth of meritocracy. But it shouldn't have to happen to you for it to matter to you. Silence and complacency in situations of injustice make you complicit. The third reason for the silence of racialized minorities is that if you complain, the backlash is severe. There is clear research on this regarding complaints of harassment at work and universities. Accusing someone of racism is like accusing them of being a pedophile. It triggers outrage. Nuclear war breaks out. The accused fights to the death. The institution worries about its reputation. They may not act as fast as they should. The complainant is often cast as the problem. They're the troublemaker. They're frozen out. They suffer huge emotional uh, mental health costs with associated damage to reputation, future prospects, and social connections. I mean, sometimes I come into a room and I think people treat me like I just farted. You know, they will sort of edge away, you know. I mean, I, I, I met uh, someone recently who's, you know, I actually won't say who he is, obviously, and he said, I'm scared to talk to you because you might tweet about me. And I think, well, you m might you say something I'd want to tweet about? <laughs> you know, um, so I think we need to find a way for people to raise the subject without triggering nuclear war. We need to signal from the top. I'm really glad you're here, Irene. The leadership the importance of diversity inclusion, and it's got to keep going, right? Because it gives others in the institution mandate to take action or to do things one way rather than another. And we have to allocate proper resources to it, and I see we're doing that. We say we're a place of international learning. Our graduate population is fantastically international. So race should be right up there with gender, sexuality, in terms of the intention and the resources we devo devote to it. In the UK universities, nearly 85% of professors identify as white, 15% as Asian or other ethnic backgrounds, and only 0.7% are black. The Bar Standards Board reports that minority ethnic barristers earn just at 68% of the income of white barristers, and minority ethnic women earn just 41%, and this can't be explained by practicing areas or experience. The Bar Council found that black and Asian women are four times more likely to experience bullying and harassment at work than white men, and minority ethnic barristers are more likely to be referred to the regulator for disciplinary action. Black barristers say, people assume you are the cleaner wearing a suit or the criminal accused. You have to get over that initial headwind before you even get to start to do your job. In our apex Supreme Court, we have 11 white men and one white woman, when the 13% of the population are BAME. Universities are in the business of academic excellence, but when we come to selecting for excellence, we, we do tend to reproduce after our own kind. We can't help it. It's instinctive, part of our evolutionary biology to be tribal, to separate them from us as a prophylactic against danger. But that serves us really badly in a modern, interconnected, multicultural world. If we don't recognize the importance of diversity and inclusion, we can be blinkered as to what constitutes excellence. We choose those who are most like us, who do the things we do, and do it the way we do it, right? We can fail to recognize excellence in those who are different from us, who do things differently from us, who study different things or use different methodology. When I started my project on the contract laws of 14 Asian jurisdictions 11 years ago, a huge number of people said, why are you even bothering? What's the point of it? What are you going to learn? You know, it's no, it's, there's no point doing it. Um, and I was pretty um, demoralized by it did it anyway. Um, we need to train um, 
We need to have trained E&D representation on appointments panels. This is important not just for race, but for all protected characteristics. And I think we need to recognise the cultural taxation on racialised minorities. They often do a lot to serve the institution's need for E&D representation on committees or to demonstrate their knowledge and commitment to a cultural group, which may bring accolades to the institution, but is often unrecognised and unrewarded by the institution. Racialised minorities also have to play the role of advocate, counsellor and therapist for other racialised minorities. For example, students, a role uh, that most other faculty don't have to assume. This work should be properly recognised rather than presumed and it should be appreciated rather than regarded with suspicion. Institutions and individuals need to act. We do want to, you know, we are academic. We want to ask for more information, more data, more interpretation, more papers, more reports. But don't delay acting until the never-never when people are fully satisfied. They never will be. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Justice delayed is justice denied. And you can only steer a moving car. So we need to move. And finally, I thought, what does it take for anyone to thrive in a university setting? Well, two things. Of course you have to be fucking amazing, right? You have to be good, creative, persuasive. You have to have confidence. You have to believe in yourself. But crucially, and this is out of your hands, you need acceptance and recognition as being excellent. You can't do it by yourself. Of having a presence, of being acknowledged by others in the relevant community. So you feel not only that you've got something to say, but that others will give you the time of day. And the problem is that racialized minorities are often denied the second. As I've said, they've long had to edit themselves to be acceptable, to be heard, to be recognised, to belong. Lewis Hamilton, you know, our racing car driver friend, said the entry point to my sport was a square and I was a hexagon and I thought I'm never going to fit through that bloody thing. So I had to morph, myself, morph my way in and then get back to the shape I was before. So, and I thought about this and this is something which will sound trivial but it's actually really important. Racialized minorities are often excluded from the social circle of belonging, of colleagues asking for your views, taking what we say seriously, asking us to join for a walk, a drink, a coffee, a dinner, a football, stopping to chat, giving us eye contact or a nod of acknowledgement in recognition that we belong on the same side. <laughs> These are intangible, subjective, but consequentialist stuff that signal your exclusion. It is discrimination by omission. Ali Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor, said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. I just don't see you. There's no need for great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding is enough. Michelle Wu, who's a daughter of Taiwanese immigrants, said so many of us have known, I mean, she's the new mayor of Boston, she said so many of us have known our whole lives what it feels like to be both invisible and always sticking out but not seen for the person you are and judged and discriminated against simply because of our appearance. We all have unconscious bias. You have it, I have it. To deny it is an oxymoron. If being educated means anything, it means we should not recoil from learning about things that make us uncomfortable, that make us see things in a different way. After all, we teach our students to do that every day. Diversity is not a zero-sum game. Excellence is a multi-dimensional concept. And like the gene pool, diversity makes us stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy, and now Cambui. So thank you ever so much uh, to Monica and Ella for their pioneering work and to Mindy for her courage and commitment to share some of her experiences revealing some deeply troubling moments in everyday life and many I, I relate to have experienced, as have many minorities, on a daily basis. It's usual for minorities to be doing the extra work of existing in a racist world. 
and they take it for granted. It's factored into everything you do. My dear father warned me, you will work four times as hard. You will have to get there. And everyone just factors it in. Yeah, factors it in. So racism in everyday life is the work of the here group, led by Cathy. And it started off as such a small, modest project, but it's flourished into this enormous coalition. And it's beautiful and it's fantastic to see it grow in that way. But it's a very difficult thing to do, and I hope in the conversations we have afterwards and the continuing conversations, because this can only be a first conversation, that we, we develop the skills to be confident in having conversations about it. It's difficult to talk about because it, it almost interferes with our thinking when we mention it. It breaks links in our thoughts. Um, we literally are unable to hear it sometimes and hear what the other person is saying. It gets censored both by our own beliefs internally, but what people are telling us most of the time. We lack the vocabulary sometimes and we're fearful of getting it wrong and tiptoeing and walking on uh, eggshells. It feels very fragile and clumsy and stigmatising. We feel fearful of being humiliated or shamed in having those conversations. And I'm not talking just about minorities, I'm talking about everybody. There's a fear of activation of latent identities and histories of violence. The history of race is littered with violence a fear of conflict and death. And racism is a form of trauma. It disrupts your thinking, it causes emotional dysregulation, it causes impulsivity, it makes you doubt who you are, it causes disempowerment, and people are unable to advocate for themselves. We know it's associated with higher rates of poor mental health, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorders, even incident psychosis, there's evidence, there's strong studies showing that. It's not a minor problem. It's also associated with physical health problems and clustered with other forms of adversity, it can even reduce life expectancy through uh, weathering. Your inflammatory markers are elevated all the time, you're more likely to get ill, and worryingly, the trauma is also gen uh, transmitted intergenerationally. So it affects the way you bring up your kids, both psychologically, socially, emotionally. It's hard to confront. Uh, the egregious, obvious versions of racism are visible, but the nuanced, subtle, polite forms are very difficult, and Mindy's alerted us to both. It's performative. Uh, people have to work very hard to get through it. It's difficult to know that you will have to work four times as hard, that promotions will be harder, that papers will not be published as easily because you've got an interesting name and people won't want to publish it or not, don't recognise you as part of, the, part of the group. It's hard to confront those. There's also a loss of the self in adapting, the, the morphing that Mindy described, that you have to compromise, you have to wear a mask. There is a cathecting off of the self, what Fanon called uh, wearing of a, of a mask in his famous book, but also his response to it was a form of psychopolitics, understanding you're in a political terrain which is psychological and has to be active. There has to be activism in the process to solve the problem. So for victims of racism, it's challenging. Even if you're successful, you carry a greater allostatic load. You carry more strain. So successful people who look fantastic also carry that strain. It must have been painful to give that talk and to re-give it and re-give it. And the burden you carry around with you is exhausting, having to constantly challenge people and ask questions. And like Mindy, at times I go quiet and go and rest. So it's not work that people rush to. Like any trauma response, you avoid it. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to be re-exposed. Now, my learning has largely been through working in NHS organisations in mental health systems. I'm a psychiatrist and psychoanalytic psychotherapist and insisting on scholarship to understand the problem, partly because the literacy is so poor, even though there's stacks of data out there, and trying to understand the dynamics and structure and function of racism, coming at it from sociology, anthropology, psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theories, phenomenological analyses, thinking also about the racial transference, the relationship, the emotion. I spend all my time thinking about emotion and the relationships and the, what's called the transference and counter-transference, how we make each other feel, how much of that is actual, accurate, reflecting the person's presence versus my own baggage. That's a constant dynamic that we're, we're involved in. And the way unconscious material is beyond reach and deeply disguised and defended, yet leaks into everyday life on a, on a daily basis. So there are two main things I want to talk about. One, the structural barriers and what they look like when you're trying to do this work, 
And this is from work in the Synergy Collaborative Centre and previous work I've done with governments and policymakers to try and improve race equality in mental health systems, which include social care systems, which include society, in fact. Um, and the second point I want to talk about is, is what a progressive response might look like. Again, drawing a lot on the sorts of narratives that uh, Ella uh, has given and uh, Monica and um, uh, Mindy have already outlined. They've alluded to some of the things I was going to mention. So the first big barrier is the silence, the silence of racism. And this is it's not only unconscious and hidden, but people just don't find it easy to talk about, but it just doesn't exist for most. It's a non-concept. We talk a lot about race only referring to black and minority ethnic groups as if white people are devoid of uh, discrimination against them, but also there are subcultures, marginalized groups within the white, white populations. There's been decades of hurt and harm. You know, I work with mental health service users, and they're really fed up. They've been consulted, they've been researched, they've been investigated. Nothing has happened for 60-odd years of data showing marked inequalities of care practices, including detention and coercion. There's really an authentic and humane interest. Often these things become intellectual objects that we have to manage in our everyday lives. Uh, and that's understandable, the pressures of life, the busyness. There is always something else to do. It's always too hard to do this. It's in the too hard to do box. And there's pessimism, negativity. Uh, and that pessimism gets in the way. So that's the first thing we have to tackle. This is not something to be negative about, something to attack, something to be positive about how we can help each other flourish and survive and do better. It's a shame because when people have tried to do something about it, there's a lots of resistance, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment, but it's such a, a waste of life. I've seen in the mental health system, for example, I've talked about 60 years of data. These are real people who've suffered as a consequence of systems that don't really help them. But the leaders in those fields, when they are interrogated later, regret it. They're contrived, of course they are. But that's 60 years of wasted life for a lot of people, particularly if when you have these experiences and you have cluster disadvantage, not just racism, but poverty and socioeconomic inequalities, you're going to die early. You literally will die earlier. Complaint systems are difficult. They're adversarial. They don't help. They punish the victims. So you've got to think about that. But as soon as you start to do something, as Mindy's outlined, there's often resistance. So in the psychodynamic world, for every group, there's an anti-group. There's always an internal saboteur in personality theory. And in any group you're working in, whether it's conscious or unconscious, there will be an internal saboteur. And you have to be honest and open about that and have those conversations. Often you don't know your internal saboteur yourself. It's deeply buried away in your own unconscious. And so you're busy doing stuff, thinking you're doing a great job, but it's actually interfering and making things worse. What Covell has called a meta-racist. So there's no obvious racist intention or act. But using the existing structures of our organisations and institutions, you reinforce our policies and practices, and you sustain a situation or make it worse for particular groups. So I'll give you some examples. Um, so I was working with the Delivering Race Equality Programme between 2005-2010, uh, led by Department of Health and Social Care Institutions. And right in the middle of the programme, a group of psychiatrists decided they were going to oppose this, and they wanted racism removed from all policy and legislation. They succeeded. They persuaded government to remove it from policy and legislation. So after that, it was completely quiet. When I started the Synergy Collaborative Centre with colleagues, uh, there was nobody talking about it. They were hurt, they were disappointed, they'd walked away, nothing had been achieved. Mental Health Act reforms, the Act's been revised several times. We know there are racial inequalities. Some people explain them away as uh, natural phenomena, as acceptable, but it's not right, is it? Some people require four times the level of detention as others. And that's just one example I'm giving you that I'm close to, but there will be many other examples you can think of. It's topical. There is a bill in Parliament at the moment trying to improve legislation, but everybody's clear that this alone won't do it. You need to change the whole system. You need to change the social context, the resources, investment. Lots and lots of things are needed. COVID exposed all these problems uh, in a dystopian way, and but we've seen the backlash that people have resisted the implications of Black Lives Matter and COVID and wanted to eradicate any scholarship in the system. So for every system, there are going to be feedback loops, and we have to have systems thinking. Mark Pedigree has talked about wicked problems, that these problems, when you try and tackle them, they change very quickly, 
and you can't respond quickly enough. So you have to have feedback loops yourself. You have to have wicked solutions for the wicked problems to make sure that you can be agile and show the alacrity needed. So we have to disrupt, remodel and interrogate and change existing power structures. Uh, some call this decolonization. But power structures of any sort will be hijacked, will be exploited. It doesn't matter about colonial, whatever the structures there are, they will be hijacked and used to disadvantage some groups over others. It's a big ask, isn't it, of leaders to be doing all of that. So what are progressive actions? Um, Again, I'm speaking from a lot of learning from the Synergy Collaborative Centre, which is a five-year program funded by a charity, not by government, who said to us one thing. They said, values and processes, that's all we're interested in. Like, don't worry about the outcomes. Get your values right, get your processes right, and make sure you manage power. Uh, it was a really challenging experience. We were working in six or seven localities in the country we were working with people who were terrified of what they were asked to do by their organisations, people who didn't know how to do it, some people uh, in some localities. Um, the NGOs didn't get on with the health system, health system didn't get on with social care, and so on and so forth. So they're fragmented systems, and each, each area was different, different in terms of what the ecostructure was, uh, the personalities, how interested they were, how uninterested they were. But we had them signed up, and we pursued a systems approach. At the centre of that, we put experience. So I'm really pleased you've all mentioned experience. Absolutely, it's experience data. Experience isn't subjective. It tells you about the world and what's really going on in the world. I mean, I trained as an epidemiologist, but experience beats the complexity of any statistical model that I've ever generated because it tells you about so many nuanced issues going on for the individual, and it tells you about the world. So the anthropologists have a, an advantage on us uh, over us on, on that, I think. Uh, it's got to be personal. So treating this issue as an intellectual object, if, it's not, if you're not touched by it, if you're not entangled by it, or the assumption you won't be entangled by it, you will, and you've got to be prepared to be changed by it, to get involved, to care enough that you want to still do it. It's what psychoanalytic psychotherapists do all the time. They know they're going to be changed by the people they work with. So it's got to be personal. You will have to manage strong divergent narratives uh, that we've already heard about. Service user groups disagree. Different service users have different views. Different professionals have different views, as I've outlined already. There will be lots of disagreement. And you've somehow got to manage, in a capacious way, all of those views, but keep an eye on the prize. What's the objective? And we found that it is possible, completely possible, to have people who are diametrically opposed uh, in their views, but the prize is the same, and they want to work together, and they're willing to. It takes a long time to grow that respect and trust and part of that is to create spaces, we've called them creative spaces, in which people give up power. So we wouldn't meet in this sort of venue. We'd meet in a high street somewhere, in a shop or an art gallery. Uh, and we wouldn't necessarily talk about the issue directly. We'd be have an exhibition, maybe, or a performance. Uh, because arts evokes creativity and aesthetic processes which somehow combat those trauma reactions and responses that we tend to be triggered by. And by having spaces in which people can meet and share power and acknowledge their differences, and they meet as people, so they leave their professional identities at the door. Because if you don't meet as, if you come in with your professional identity, you're worried about your job, aren't you? You're worried about what the boss is going to say when they hear what you said in, in, in that meeting. You're worried about what your priorities are. So you really have to give up space and come along as, as yourself. And central to that process is. The, the, the challenge of challenging yourself, what Paul Hoggett's called intellectual aggression to evacuate the squatters, the squatters in your own mind, the ideologies that you sit there in, a, in the back of your, your mind that you're not able to change, that aren't available for external exploration or modification, and maybe even to you are hidden away and kick in when you least expect them. Scholarship remains the task because it's got to be central to all the activity that we do because there's lots of learning to be done. But it's very easy to say, let's make this an administrative exercise or a legislative exercise. But for me, it's always been about scholarship, that without scholarship, nothing, nothing's achievable because we've got to be learning all the time. And the literacy levels are so poor on this topic. You know, When we started the work post-DRE uh, in 2010, um, we talked to clinicians, service users, 
they just didn't know the 60 years of data. We were going to them saying, look, there's all this data. What are we going to do about it? What are you talking about? We don't know anything about it. What data? So actually, we assume the public know. We assume professionals know. We assume we're all in positions of uh, empowerment through knowledge. But that's not the case. And so that's a really difficult one when you have to start off a relationship and start off a group process that people are starting at very, in very different places and spaces. Their world to them is true, but it may not be the world as you see it. Uh, and it's how you can have people meeting with those different views. So experience is central, creative spaces, making it psychologically safe for people, participatory processes, not just doing intellectual, verbal, cognitive tasks, but things that are participatory and, and allow people to be creative and see value in what they do. Understanding the values and processes, being true to them. If there's doubt, if there's disagreement, go back to the experience, go back to the values and processes. Co-design everything. Don't assume that as a leader you have to do it all. By leader, I don't mean just mean VC and people who are in leadership positions, but I mean everybody. We're all leaders in this space. We have to be. It's not going to happen just by a few people doing stuff. But co-design. Uh, have that experience in there so you really challenge what you're doing at every stage and iteratively work. Adopt the principles of implementation science and design thinking, which isn't necessarily what scientists do, you know, but design thinking is very powerful. You know, designing an iPhone and making sure it works now and making sure you get an upgrade and making sure it's right for the moment. That's, that's a different sort of approach to implementation than perhaps scientists would, would do where we'd want to get the data and be sure it's going to work. This is an ongoing process, an organic process. And the most important ingredient, of course, is leadership that we've heard about. Mindy's mentioned it. We thought we'd be spending a lot of time working with groups, implementing changes and interventions in these venues. But what we spent more time doing, probably 70% of the time, was helping the leaders to be leaders by allying with them, going to meetings with them, persuading the chief executives, persuading, persuading the community groups to work with them, holding hands, um, reinforcing their confidence, working through scenarios with them, and maintaining a compassionate stance, that compassionate leadership was really important here. Collaborative leadership, we called it. We've written that up on the Synergy Collaborative Centre's website if you wanted to look that up. There's, there are briefing papers on that. Commitment is not a passing fad. It's not something you parachute in and out of. Uh, so the first thing that people object to if you're in a post which is time limited and you're not going to be with people for a long time they're not going to invest in you they've been exploited enough so people aren't going to spend time with you you've got to be extremely courageous and uh, you know mindy sort of just uh, epitomizes that really that you, you will confront a lot of challenges um, a lot of attacks on your leadership ways to uh, demean you diminish you and interestingly high status Minorities are attacked more. There's a form of racism that sees them that causes cognitive dissonance in the meta-racist, uh, and therefore they end up being attacked for the work that they do and diminished. Using existing power structures, of course. So we have to be really careful when we think about promotion and performance reviews and how we implement those. There's, there's some real you know, fireworks that could be uh, understood if we're, not, if we're not careful about that. And obviously setting the bar very high for what, what's to be achieved, whether people are interested in what you do. Um, uh, and are often doing these tasks with no resources. That's a really important point that Mindy's made, that uh, you know, EDI roles uh, are set up with insufficient resources or people are asked to be lead leaders and you ask for the resources where well, there are none. The estimation of the task is poor. It's grossly underestimated what's involved, not only personally, but also in terms of what it requires to change a system and to have everybody involved in, 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 a, in a single purpose. The other principle we have is always work to the exception. Uh, it's very easy to develop policies and practices which work to the norms and the average. Uh, and of course, you then discover you've left out a group or somebody else says, well, that doesn't represent me at all. You know, I mean, why have you not even bothered? So you've got to look for the, it's much better to develop policy and practices by working with people in extreme situations of intersectionality, by age, gender, race, sex, um, place they live in, housing, all sorts of things, and not see them as outliers, lose the word outliers. They are central to any generic policy. And if you have enough robust policies around exceptions, they will be working for the majority as well. So there is a role for the academy in um, thinking about this. and extending into the communities, working with in partnership, uh, but it does require a particular sort of leadership, a systems 
thinking leadership, which means you've got to tolerate uncertainty. You can't be heroically leading from the front. You've got to lead from the back sometimes. You've got to uh, build trust and respect working with people, be in coalitions, be honest, be yourself, uh, and let people be who they want to be. And it's very difficult. Uh, it's, I joke with my team, I can walk into a room and offend people just by being my, who I am, you know, by my demographic and by my profession, and um, depending on what, you know. Uh, so you, you have to really be self-aware and manage yourselves differently. So I'll end with just a few key points. I think I'm slightly out of time. Um, experience is central to everything we do, and I think understanding the stories that we've heard about is central to how we motivate people to change and help people remember what's at stake and what matters. Listening and learning, easily said, difficult to do. You will be changed. Do you have the time or commitment for the task? Don't underestimate it. Don't do it badly. You're going to make things worse. Do it well or not at all. Research is central to scholarship. The organisational commitment is necessary. Uh, our students and our staff well-being is at stake. Their lives are at stake. It's not a minor issue. It's a public health problem, but it's also an organisational responsibility. And we need this leadership of collaborative, kind, compassionate care. Now, I'm as impatient as anyone. And it's Martin Luther King who talked about the long arc of justice. But we, this is slow, steady work. This won't be done quickly in any institution or organisation. But at the same time, it requires a certain type of leadership, of compassionate, kind leadership. And I know I've said this to the team at here several times, and I'm really moved by Maya Angelou's quote that you need to astonish the world with your kindness because it's the one thing you have. And you can still keep doing this thing. You can still keep working. So that's not only for those who are victims of racism, but also for leaders when they're put in positions of difficulty. People aren't putting you in that position on purpose, they don't hate you, they, they, they just, you've got to be able to stand up to that and take that, but return not with the retaliatory response that you might be triggered into uh, delivering, but actually a compassionate and kind response that allows you to be a good systems leader and take people with you, irrespective of uh, differences. That all comes down to the relationship, interpersonal relationships and trust. So I'll stop there. I, there was lots Mindy uh, had mentioned that I was going to refer to, but I, I think I'll come back to it in the discussion, yeah. Thank you. So, I said we might need a day for this because it's kind of big, and we might need a century for this because it's kind of big. I have some questions from the people online, so I'm going to go to them first so that they are included. Um, and I want to begin with a question, which is uh, a thank you to all the speakers from um, AMA who says, Mindy, you use the term unconscious bias. Is this another term that we use so that the majority avoids feelings of discomfort? Is it simply bias? Well, I, no, I, I think it is. I think a lot of it is unconscious, actually. I, you know, because I started thinking, well, OK, how am I unconsciously biased? Because obviously... You know, I'm not biased, but I'm unconsciously biased. That's what we all... And I thought, well, I'm probably ableist, you know, and I have to be careful about that sort of thing. And I'm probably racist in my own... I mean, the, you know, Asians have their own, you know, brands of racism. And, you know, they're not comfortable subjects, but you have to think about the assumptions you grow up with. Okay. And, um, yeah, all those shortcuts we take, which... Um, Sometimes helpful, very often not helpful yeah. at all. So I don't think that's right. I mean, it may be that it may sometimes serve that function, but I think there really is such a thing because honestly, I think most people are trying their best and they don't, they're not, you know, they're not, they're not conscious of it. Yeah. I think you, sometimes you do it and you think, oh, did I just do that? I mean, I said something to a student and I thought, oh gosh, I just, you know, racially stereotyped you and I'm so sorry you know but, but these things come out before you you're aware of it so no I don't uh, yeah okay thank you um and I've got a question that uh I think maybe our resident psychiatrist might be able to answer although it's not directed at you Cam but I'm going to ask you do you think the human ego is the main contributor to racism and does the human ego essentially contribute to how one person reacts to another person's skin color 
apologies for assuming that you would so answer as a, a question. I mean, I have views on the psychotherapist about what ego is. So, I mean, if you mean by ego just your self-confidence and presence, um, and that gets in the way, uh, you know, narcissism, we all need a bit of narcissism to get through life. Um, it, yes, absolutely, it blinds you. Um, but ego is also understood as the function of the mind that mediates all those primitive impulses that are repressed that you're unaware of, as well as what your parents taught you. And so it, it's the bit of you that relates to the external world. So that's a slightly different understanding of it, uh, I think. Um, I also have trouble with the notion of an unconscious bias, because the unconscious for me is something which is quite different from something that you can access by conversation. So you know, maybe the pre-conscious space that we're in. Mm. Um, uh, and most therapists spend years working with patients on, on their unconscious two, three, five times a week sometimes and, and not getting anywhere near to changing the unconscious. Yeah, I wondered whether socialised bias might be a better way of describing yeah. it. But, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, and Ella, we're not going to let you and Monica off the hook because there's a question here that says, there's been a, you mentioned there was a lack of research into structural and systemic racism. Why do you think that is and how do you see this moving forward in the future? That's something that sociologists love to <laughs> ask ourselves, isn't it? I might uh, uh, turn to Monica for that one. Yeah, well, I don't think there is lack of research on structural racism. Um, what we were, I think the, I mean, if I remember well, the comment was coming from uh, when we were saying that we don't want this project to focus on individuals, but focus on the the, the mapping, the the bigger picture, the um, the fabric, the terrain of racism, to indicate we're interested in the structural systemic aspect of it, um, and that that was that that's going to help for the project, but. If we move to the research, no, there is a lot of research looking at structural racism. And I think it's always, um, it's a difficult thing with this project and other interventions, particularly from the EDI sort of sector, because we tend to focus and have an understanding of racism as something individual, as something that has to do with attitudes, with prejudice. So while there might be some of these elements here, uh, I think what we want is to also factor in that sometimes it's not it's not necessarily to find blame. The the point is when we the, or the problem when we think of it as prejudice or as behavior, we then tend to find okay, so who do we blame? So you're guilty of doing this, so therefore you have to mend your ways and be a better person. And that is a very limited perspective. Of course, we can all do individual work and we must do individual work about it. But we also need to be thinking about how this is supported collectively and, and structurally. So a very long answer to just say, very joining to some of those thoughts. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sorry, slightly to exact. I was the one who said that. And what I was, I was actually referring to a... Um, a literature review which was looking at the research, looking specifically at universities and saying that there's really not enough. You know, we, and I, I don't know why that is, and I, you can speculate that I think as universities, sometimes we're not very good at looking at ourselves yeah. and studying ourselves and admitting to our own selves that we have mm -hmm. the problems we see out in the social world. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, the clock here is telling me one time, so I, I'm going to go by this clock which says we're over by a minute. Okay, so one of the questions on here is what's next for the Help End Everyday Racism project? So I think I will tell you about that. This project started from a colleague's experience of everyday racism, which she told me and which blindsided me because my privilege meant that I, it had never occurred to me that what she described would have happened here. <laughs> and... I then met Monica and Ella and the team at Cambridge and learnt about their methodology of solidarity and I encourage you to look at the website and find out about their methodology which is a story making 
collective process that is using digital technologies but is not creating misery memoirs to just constantly repeat the stories of everyday racism but is taking those lived embodied emotional experiences and the consequences of racism and saying we must do something about that. I would like to do that project here. We have a website more or less ready to go, but we want to engage in the conversations that Cam has described so that this community gets behind that project in the way that the communities at Cambridge and Essex have done. So we have a methodology of solidarity ready. This night, if this is the only thing that we do publicly, is enough for me right now in the sense that this story needed to be told here and it's so important that you all came and I'm so delighted that you all came. But for me, we are nothing if we're not about learning. I love this place. I've only been here since 2019. I can't believe how much it's got under my skin. And I love the project that we've worked with, with a tiny bit of money from the Research Culture Enhancement Fund to do some of this. And the conversations I have had and the relationships and the people I've met have changed me, have transformed me, have made me think. And I hope that that's what the Help End Everyday Racism Project will do for you and everybody out there that we will learn, we will reflect, we will listen. And um, earlier on, I think Ellie, you said we can all do something. We can all do something. So one of the questions here, and I'm really sorry to the people in the room that might have burning questions, but we can go and drink and ask those questions, <laughs> um, is that um, Cam said something about the immense additional effort that members of the university have to do to support fellow racial minorities. What does the university intend to do to recognise this and how that, that, that can often be a burden? And what I would say is my learning has been just how insidious everyday racism is, the huge consequences that it has, and the fact that we can all do something. We can step up, those with privilege can step in front and we can be the change that we want to see. So without further ado, I'd like to thank our speakers and remind them that they're awesome and I love them. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and letting me go on a little bit over time. The people in the room get to have a drink of uh, alcohol or not, as the case may be, and you at home are, should also encourage yourselves to do that also and join with us because we will take little steps, but we will work to tackle everyday racism. So thank you to the team and everybody that helped put this on. I've got some gifts that are down there. I'm gonna give those now while you all do massive applause. Right, I've also got something in my bag. Can I give you, can you hold those for a minute? Okay, right, if you just hold those for the moment. Okay, um, for my esteemed panellists, and yours will be in the post, um, I bought Natalie Diaz's post-colonial love poem for you all because it, it touched me and I hope it would touch you. So that's for you. Um, and Catherine, who works with me, many Catherines work with me, Catherine said, can we get them flowers? So I said, you should all have flowers also. And I would have been completely laden down with gifts uh, if I got gifts for everybody in the team. And I cannot do the Oscar roll call of the HERE team because there are many people who've made this happen, that have made the website happen, that have done all of the amazing things. And if I start with a list of names, I'll miss out two really important people and then I'll feel bad for the rest of my life. So. I'm going to thank one other person because she has a role that makes a difference to me. And when I waver and say, this is too hard, I don't want to do it anymore, the blockages, the institutional barriers, it's all too much, why am I doing this on top of my day job? She just looks at me and says, what would you like me to do? Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Drink. Oh, yes. Go on, yeah. Yes. Okay. I couldn't carry any more.